Well, good morning again. I'm back. Hey, uh, you, if you were here last week or listening, you know, we had planned a different series, but as we talked through the week and just felt like maybe there was some different uh, different things that we could be teaching that would be more helpful, could help us look more like Jesus. And so we made a pivot to go to the ways of Jesus in this series. And, you know, we're starting this series and we'll teach it for a few weeks. Now, early on, um, the very first thing that we see followers of Christ called, they're called followers of the way. Okay. Before they're called Christians, before they're called, uh, you know, they're not called right wing conservatives or left wing liberals. They're called followers of the way. And that comes from this saying of Jesus. When Jesus is teaching, he says this, he says, I am the way to life, right? This is what Jesus says. He calls himself the way. The early Christians, when they began to follow Jesus and they were actually thrown in jail, they were thrown in jail for being followers of the way. And people who follow the way are called disciples. Let me hear you say disciples. That's good. Y'all are better than first service. That's great. Um, They're called disciples. Now, I I feel like I need to, uh, we don't use the word disciple a lot outside of church. And so let me kind of unpack a little bit about what a disciple is. So help us to understand a little bit about what um, the direction we're going today. Um, A disciple is someone who Jesus would be if Jesus were you. Okay. Someone who Jesus would be if Jesus were you. So think about it this way. Maybe anybody sit on some hours of Zoom calls this week, WebEx calls, and that like so. If, if if Jesus were you and he's sitting on five six hours of WebEx calls, like how would he respond to people? What would be his priorities? How would he be paying attention? Would he wear a polo with his gym shorts like most of us do that nobody can see? Or maybe even you were in your underwear. I don't know. That's a little TMI. Too much information because some of you are watching your underwear right now online. That's awesome. Um, and so, so, so who would Jesus be? How would he respond? So let's say, you know, you're out this week and maybe you go to Whole Foods and you're shopping for a turkey or a ham or whatever it is you're going to have for Thanksgiving. Like, like how would he treat people? What would be his perspective? What are, how would he respond? And so this is what it means to be a disciple. Someone who Jesus would be, if Jesus were in your circumstances, with your experience, with your life situation, wherever that is. And, and we are a Jesus-centered, discipleship-driven church. We're a Jesus-centered, discipleship-driven church. So Jesus-centered is the reason why we just did Jesus over everything. It's because as we came back to live services, we wanted to be sure that amidst all the noise, amidst all the chaos, amidst all the distraction, that we were really clear on what we were about. Like that we didn't let any information kind of any other, t- any other direction kind of bleed into what we were doing. We want to make a really clear statement about our culture and who we are because we are a Jesus church. Now we're discipleship driven. And, and here's what that means. Discipleship driven just means that Jesus is here and he's saying, hey, follow me, act like me, do the things that I would do, come with me. And then as soon as you get a little close, you know what Jesus does? He moves. He says, hey, come on. We got some work to do. We, we got some transformation to happen. You've got, you've got further to go. And here's why this is important. Is as you do that with Jesus, it is where you find life. Amen, somebody? It's where you find purpose. It's, it's the reason why you can get up in the morning and have motivation and direction in life. It's because as you follow Jesus, you begin to set your eyes to a different horizon and you live differently. This is why this is so critically important. And also on a practical level, as we begin to look more like Jesus, understand his teachings, understand the way that the world works, it helps us in our day-to-day life. It helps us navigate relationships. It helps us know how to, what to do with, how our, with our finances. It helps us in our parenting. It helps us in our dating. It helps us to navigate daily life. Now, now here's what I know about life. Our lives tend to rob us of life. You know what I'm talking about? You appreciate that? Like our lives tend to drain us of the life that we want to live. Man, we have so many demands on our, on our time, so many duties that we need to uh, kind of buy into, that we need to accomplish, so many tasks that need to happen. And if I'm honest, over the last you know, eight months, it has been hard to stay motivated. Anybody feel that? And it's been hard to kind of move forward. There are days you wake up and you're like, can I just circle the wagons and stay in the bed? You know, I mean, it gets, it can be hard. This is what happens, but, but there's a better way to live. Now, now, now here's what we need. The, the thing I want to talk about today, and I know that it's, it, it's, it's very applicable for me and I know it's applicable to you. 
And some of you I know personally, I know that it's applicable to you. And this is going to be applicable for all of us. Like if I'm here and Jesus wants to take me there, there's something that has to happen here. Right. There, there's something that has to happen here before I can get to there. And what happens to happen here is that there is something that I have got to leave here if I'm going to go there. Something I got to leave here. Anybody felt like they le- left some things in 2020? Anybody, anything maybe you were like, oh, I didn't know I was going to leave that. It was painful, maybe. And, and, and for some people, there's some things that, that you've had to leave that, that were actually, you didn't mind leaving them. But maybe there's some things that you feel like you need to leave or going to have to leave. You're like, oh, I don't know if I want to leave that. I want to hang on. But man, leaving things is only good for our future. And we want to leave behind today what we can't lose tomorrow. Now, now uh, I'm experiencing this in a lot of different ways in my life right now. But specifically last weekend, uh, we were gone um, to visit my daughter. My daughter just got engaged. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Somebody online want to drop a dollar sign emoji in the chat? <laughs> you know, and there's some things that, 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 that we're going to leave, that Debbie and I are going to leave. And there's some things that she's going to leave, like she is going to leave the payroll. Somebody say amen. Uh, but man, there are some things that are going to change. Like I'm always their dad, but some things are going to be different. Now, fortunate for us, we're going to gain a son-in-law who's awesome. He's a baller, man. We love him. And so we're excited about that. But there are some things that we're going to leave in that relationship. And for all of us today, I wonder what it is that, that you're going to need to leave. Like, I wonder what's holding you back. I wonder what's kind of keeping you tangled up and keeping you from getting where you need to go. So let's grab our Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Mark today. We're going to be in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1. Now, Mark is one of those parts of the Bible that was written by an eyewitness of Jesus' life. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. Now, as we, as we get to Mark chapter 1, Jesus has just started his ministry And so he's just come on the scene and all of their dreams are coming true. The nation of Israel and the Jewish people and the people that we're about to read about. They had been looking for this person called the Messiah to show up. They had been expecting someone to come and set them free. They had been hoping that he was going to happen in their lifetime and Jesus shows up. And now what Jesus is doing, he's kind of already burst into public, uh, into the public scene. And now he's going to start gathering people for the movement. He's going to start gathering people who follow him, gathering disciples to follow him. Starts in verse 16. It says, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. Now, Simon is also Simon Peter. If you've, if you've read anything in the Bible or heard anything, you know, Peter is kind of the, he's kind of the ringleader of the disciples. He's one of the big guys. And so Simon is also Peter, same person. Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, they were casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So Jesus is like, hey, follow me. Like you're a fisher of fish right now. I want want to take who you are. I'm going to take the things you like. I'm going to take your experiences. And I want you to to follow me. Leave your nets behind. But I want you to follow me. And I'm going to give you purpose. And when you have this kind of purpose, what happens is your priorities change, don't they? You have a different perspective on what life is to be about. You don't get bogged down as much in the day-to-day grind and you keep your eyes on the horizon. It keeps you motivated. So it's like, hey, come on, follow me. I'm going to give you purpose. You're going to be fishers of men. And so it says immediately they what? They left their nets. There were some things they need to leave behind. They left their nets and they followed him. And this is they went a little further. Or Jesus went a little further and he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And they were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they followed him. So you see that these guys leave their nets behind. Like there was something they had to do to be able to get where they were going. Now, now one little... One little part of this story that we need to really pay attention to is the fact that notice he didn't call them to leave one at a time. He called them to leave as brothers, as pairs. They were working together. He called them to leave together. And and when you need to leave something behind, you need some friends to help you leave something behind, don't you? Right? There's some things that you need to leave behind that maybe are difficult and need someone to cheer you on, someone to champion you. There may be some things in our lives that we need to leave behind that that we don't know we need to leave behind. And we need somebody to point those things out. And so we need people around us. We need people who are are locked arms with us to help us out. And that's what what it's called to be part of the uh, followers of the way is, man, we lock arms together and we help each other. 
Now, now notice this. Here's another aspect of this story that we can't miss. If, if, if Simon doesn't leave, do you think his brother Andrew leaves? I wonder. And sometimes we need to leave some things behind because it's good for the people around us. Sometimes we need to leave some things behind because of our care and concern for other people, not just for our own selfish interests. So they, so they, leave, they leave their nets behind. Let me talk a little bit about, about nets. You know, we, we're not necessarily fishermen in that, in that sense, but, but I just want to describe these nets because I believe this is an analogy to our lives. So the nets that that Simon and Andrew had were cast nets. So they're standing on the shore and they're just casting their nets out. They'll draw them back in, pull the fish out, hopefully, and cast them back out again. Now, the other nets that James and John had were completely different. They were these massive constructions that were three layers thick. And on the outer layers were these larger nets with larger squares in them. But there was a middle layer that was had, you know, much more close together. So fish could swim in between the larger parts and get to the middle net. And that's where they would be caught. Now, these nets are hand sewn and they're about a quarter mile long, right? Massive nets. And to weight them to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, what they would do is they would take stones, they would hand drill holes in the stones, hand tie them to the bottom of the nets. Very meticulous. They would place cork on the top of the net so that they would float. And two boats would get about a quarter mile off, 500 yards apart, and they would each hold an end of the net and then they would drag it across the Sea of Galilee. It was this epic job that took all night long. And they were so expensive and they had poured so much blood, sweat and tears into the nets that when they gathered them back up and they pulled all the fish out, what they would do is they would spend hours during the day because they fished at night. They would spend hours during the day repairing these nets, mending these nets, cleaning these nets to be sure that they were in it for the long haul. Now, I can't help but think of how these nets are an analogy to our lives. Like in the same way these nets are woven together, you know, the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Literally, the Bible says we were knit together in our mother's womb. That, that we, are, uh, we are this amalgamation. That's a big word, isn't it? Can you believe I just used that right there? Hey, somebody write the definition of amalgamation right there in the chat. We're this, this combination of experiences and background and pains and losses and victories and desires. And that, that's who we are. We all, we all different and we all have different things to leave behind. You know, God's gonna call us to leave some things behind and not call people that we know to do the same thing. And we're gonna say, why not them? And we're gonna compare ourselves, but God calls us personally to leave some things behind because that's how we move forward. And that's how we stay in, this, in this, this process of transformation, of being new. You know, nets, in this, in this particular story, a lot of times we'll look at it and we'll think, well, they had to leave behind their jobs. And they did, clearly. They left behind their jobs. But nets for them, and what Mark is trying to communicate to us, nets, it's not about income. Nets is about identity. Nets is about who we are. And this is about what is central to our life. And Mark is calling us to revolve our lives around the person of Jesus. You know, in the book of 2 Corinthians, another place in the Bible, it says if, if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. New things have come. So there's some old things that need to go. There's some old things that we need to leave behind. It's not just an add-on. There's some things that have to stay in the past so that we can move into the future that God has for us. And there's, there's good and bad things that we all need to leave behind. I think the bad things, we're all like, yeah, I want to leave that behind. You know, maybe there's some things in your life you're like, I know I need to leave that behind. Maybe you have a habit. You know, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe worse, it's the beginning of an addiction and you don't see it. Maybe there's some toxic relationships. Maybe there's some, some things that you know, man, I, I, I really need to leave those behind. But, but sometimes, sometimes there are some things that we think are good. There are some things that we like. There are some things that we want to hold on to that we need to leave. You ever had that happen? You, you ever held on to something like, oh, I know this is too good. I don't want to let go of this. God, you can have everything, but you can't have this. I can't have this. 
And, it, and when Jesus steps into our lives, it's disruptive. It is disruptive. It's disruptive in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes we can go through the motions and we adopt this version of following Jesus that doesn't disrupt us at all. And it leaves us short of life change and we wonder why. Listen, following Jesus is going to disrupt some relationships, isn't it? Anybody ever had that happen? Following Jesus is going to disrupt your finances because all of a sudden you realize, hey, these aren't mine, they're his. How can I leverage them for eternity? How can I store up treasure in heaven? But Jesus is going to disrupt your calendar, probably more precious to many of us than money. Man, Jesus is going to disrupt our calendar. It's very disruptive. But sometimes we don't know the good that's being disrupted is actually going to deliver something greater in the future. Now, now, now obviously, there's some things that um, God's going to disrupt in our lives to keep us from danger. And, and maybe you've had this happen. Here's a small illustration of that. Maybe you've been driving along in traffic and there was maybe you're on a road trip and there's somebody in front of you and they're not going as fast as you would like. Anybody ever have that happen? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody on the way to church this morning that happened? <laughs> you know, and, and then maybe you'll get up a little further ahead and you pass a highway patrolman and you think to yourself, I could have gotten a ticket, right? Now that never happens to me because I don't speed. It happens to you, not me. Or maybe, the, and this has happened to us on a road trip before, it's like we couldn't get where we we're going. We were a little frustrated and we get a little ahead and there's an accident. Like that could have been us. Like in, for some people, there's a danger ahead. There's a bridge out ahead. And what God wants to do is to leave behind some things so that you don't have that train wreck in the future. But also, also, he's going to save us from danger. But you know what else? He's got something he better for us out there. He's got some purpose he wants us to walk in. And until we're ready to leave behind these old things that are holding us back that seem good, we're never going to experience that. Now, when I got out of college, I was an, I was an actuary. Now, I, I didn't have this grand dream of being a pastor. My wife didn't have this grand dream of being a pastor's wife. And so I was an actuary. We began to really pursue in God and what he had. And we just had this sense that God wanted me, wanted us to go into ministry. That God wanted us to kind of give up that career, give up that lifestyle, give up that new house, give up those friends, give up that church and to move into ministry. And so that's what we did. And so we left and we moved to the great country of Texas to go to school. That's funny, y'all. Come on. Help me out. Anybody in here from Texas? You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, man, we moved to Texas, went to school, and just kind of gave up some things. And I look back on that and like, what, what I would have missed out on if I wouldn't have given up some things that at the time were really good. A great company, great friends. Now, the privilege that I've had and for the last 20 some odd years that I've been able to do this, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Never one day did I think, man, I wish I'd have stayed there because God had something better for us. God has something better for us. And that's true for you. I wonder where God wants to take you right now, but you, you won't leave anything behind. I wonder, I wonder what net you're holding on to. I wonder what net's got entangled around your feet. It's causing you to trip up and it's holding you back because you're not willing to let go of it for him to take you into the future. Now, now we see this in the life of Paul, Paul, greatest uh, missionary in the, in the Bible. Paul says something like this. He says, forgetting what lies behind, behind and straining towards what lies ahead. I, I, I give my all for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I love this image that Paul gives of straining ahead. It's like I've always got to be reaching. I've always got to be moving. I've always got to be looking to what it looks like for my life to revolve around Jesus. Um, it reminds me of, uh, of the 2008 Olympics with Michael Phelps. You guys remember Michael Phelps, right? Somebody, somebody drop a fish emoji in the chat right now because that guy's a fish dressed up like a human. He can swim. And there's this one race that he wins and he reaches out and he wins by 0.01 seconds, by one one hundredth of a second, a fingernail to touch the wall because he is straining ahead. And this is the image that Paul gives us of following Jesus. And if I'm straining ahead, I'm leaving some things behind. Michael Phelps left losing behind. And so will you. Now, when I read this story and I see these guys just leave their nets and follow Jesus, I'm like, why would you do that? Because on the surface, if you're just reading it at face value, 
It seems like Jesus is walking along in Galilee. He turns to some random guys he happens to be passing and says, follow me. And they, like robots, just take me to your leader, right? They just start following him. But what we know about these guys was there was a previous relationship with Jesus that they had understood about him. As a matter of fact, a year before this scene happens, Jesus is at a wedding and he performs his first miracle where he turns water into wine. And his, these disciples, these four guys were there. See, they didn't just jump up out of nowhere and begin to follow. They had a previous relationship with Jesus. And here's what that tells me about why they followed him in this moment. is that Jesus was so compelling that his personality, his mission, his way with people was so compelling they couldn't help but follow him. And as you read the stories of Jesus and, the, and, and how he operated, the words and the pages of the Bible shout to us the compelling nature of Jesus. And if you're going to leave something behind, you, you want to know what you're following. And sometimes we just need to remind ourselves and we need to continually fight for a compelling view of who Jesus is. You know, one of the things that I ask our staff uh, regularly is like, tell me today, like, what's your favorite thing about Jesus today? Like, you guys should write this question down, right? Like somebody in the chat, drop down your favorite thing about Jesus today. Like somebody probably would say grace, wouldn't you? Anybody, any grace fiends in the house? Come on, right? Some, I would say grace. We love grace. What about forgiveness of sin? Anybody want to admit to that one? Man, I am so grateful that we're forgiven for our sin, that things aren't held against us in the court of heaven, that we don't have to worry about it, that Jesus took care of it. Love grace. I love the fact that we don't have to live in insecurity. I don't have to worry about who I am and who God's created me to be and how he's working in my life, that God loves me no matter what. I love some of the personality things about Jesus. I love the fact that he would, he, he would make people laugh by just doing unexpected things. Like there's this one crazy story. This is a side note, um, but it's free. So uh, there's this story when Jesus comes back from the dead and, he's, and his disciples have gone back to fishing. You know what they did? They put some nets down, but they picked them back up. Anybody ever do that? Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that in a second. But they picked their nets up, they're back fishing. They come in from fishing. What's Jesus doing? He's on the, he's on the beach cooking fish. Like that's just funny. Like, what is he thinking? He's so disruptive in his honesty. He would just say things. I love the way he could ask and answer questions. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves of the value of Jesus. Now, I know there's a lot of people that maybe you're online or in the room. You haven't really made that decision. You don't know what your favorite thing is because you haven't really decided to follow him. I would just challenge you, like, read the pages of the Bible and, and, and just ask God what it is that, that he wants to show you about the favorite thing about Jesus. He, here's what I tell you. Probably he's going to show you that your favorite thing about Jesus is what you need right now. That's what he's going to show you. So what is it that's so compelling about Jesus? For these four, for these two sets of brothers, his life was so compelling. They gave it all. Man, they, they gave it all to follow him. Here's another thing that tends to happen with this story. is like they gave up their jobs, right? And so what pastors will say, they'll be like, hey, you know, God didn't want everybody to give up their job. You know, there's just something else God wants you to give up to follow him. It's not your job. You know what? God may want you to give up your job. I, I gave up my job. Now I got a better job. And maybe God has a better job for you. You know, God may want you to give up your house. You know, there may be that car, the guy's like, yeah, you, you should get rid of that. There are some things that could be painful that are so good that we love so much that God may ask us to give up. You know, my wife and I are in the process of selling a house we've lived in for 17 years. And, uh, you know, kids are grown now out of the house and we're just going to get something a little easier to take care of. And so a little closer in. And man, there, when you talk about 17 years, there's some pain there, not for her, but for me. Um, and, and you can imagine that, but I, we just feel like this is what God has for us. And sometimes this is how God operates, but he's so compelling. He loves us so much. He is so worth it, this Jesus that we follow. And these four gave us the example of what it looks like to leave some things behind that counted and to move into a future that was better. They leave their nets behind. Like, what do you need to leave today? What is it that you need to leave? I think for some people, maybe there's some bitterness you need to leave behind. Man, there's some things that happened to you 
There's some pain that someone caused you. There was some circumstances that didn't go your way. And man, you just, you're bitter and frustrated and you thought you'd left them behind. But guess what? You picked them back up. They got caught around your ankle and you're just carrying them through. And that bitterness is just growing its way deeper and deeper in your heart in such a way that it's just making you miss out on the transformation God has for you and it's holding you back. You know, maybe there's somebody you need to forgive today. You need to forgive them again. Because here's the reality about leaving. It's not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. We do it over and over and decide every single day what we're going to leave behind. You know, for some people, maybe it's expectations. Like you came into this year with some different expectations than what happened. Anybody, anybody's expectations change over the year? Expectations for church change? It's just different now. And I believe to the bottom of my soul, God's going to do something better than we ever would ask or imagine. Somebody say amen right there. Like, I believe that God's going to do beyond what we could have thought, better than we could have thought, for longer than we could have thought, that will echo forever and ever. I really believe that. And sometimes you have to tell yourself that. You have to remember that, man. There's some expectations you had for your life, for your relationships, man, for your marriage, for your parenting, for your finances. And you just need to leave those behind and trust God for your future. You know, it may be that you need to leave behind some comfort. Because what happens in times of stress is we tend to just want to do whatever we can just to stay comfortable. And God may want to push you out of your comfort zone right now so that you can experience what the adventure and the life is that he wants to bring to you. You know, I want to close out with a story about about Peter. Um, There's this time kind of later in their journey as they're following Jesus that the movement has gained a lot of momentum. And there's a lot of people that are following. And that's usually the time, right? You're just going to kind of, you're going to kind of really turn people loose. But but here's what Jesus does. And I love this about Jesus. He does the unexpected. So in this moment of success, in this moment of momentum, what Jesus does is he raises the level of challenge. And so when he raises this level of challenge, a lot of the disciples, they're like, too much, too much. And they start leaving. They start peeling off until it's kind of back to this smaller group of people. And Jesus looks at Peter and he asks this question. He says, do you want to leave too? Do you want to leave too? And Peter says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. And in that moment, they chose again to leave their nets. And if we're not careful, if we don't choose to follow Jesus and to leave our nets behind, we run the risk of leaving Jesus behind. He is the source of life. He is everything that we've been looking for. He is the promise of our creator. Let's pray together. In these couple of minutes that we have left, man, just in the room, online, wherever you are, let's just take a moment just to think about things that we need to leave behind. Think about things that are holding us back. Think about attitudes that we may be having, expectations. Maybe it's forgiveness that we need to offer. Maybe it's selfishness or pride. Maybe we're coveted coveting people and what they have that we don't have and what what are some things that you need to leave behind today and you need to leave it behind and just tell God I'm gonna leave it behind today you know in this moment as we just have a time of prayer I just want to speak directly and specifically to people who have never made a decision to leave anything to follow Jesus and what I would tell you is it's going to cost you something it's going to cost you your life But what you get in return is your life. More than you could dream of, more than you could ask for, more than you could ever believe. And I'm just going to challenge you in this moment today. Like, why not today? Why not make today that day you follow him? Why not make today the day you start leaving behind your selfishness, your control, 
your nets and follow him. You know, the way that we do that is just through what the Bible calls prayer. You just tell God you want to follow him. And and if that's you today, I just want to lead you in a prayer. I just want to lead you in this commitment time. So so if that's you today, just, just repeat in your heart these words. Dear God, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I'll leave it behind to follow you. Grant me a new life. I trust Jesus for my life. You know, and if you prayed that, what what the Bible tells us, what I read earlier, we are a new creation. Old things have passed, new things have come. And, And because it's such a monumental decision, it is the biggest decision you will make this year. I just want to take a second just to help you mark the moment. You know, the way that we do that is just by a simple raising of the hand. You know, we raise a hand to say, God, I'm for you. We raise a hand to say, God, I'm giving you everything. And so if that was you today, I'm just going to count to three. I'm going to ask you whether you're in the room or whether you're online, just, just to raise your hand wherever you are. One, two, three. That's awesome. Fantastic. Online, fantastic in the room. Incredible. Thank you, Lord. And so, God, thank you for those who've just made this decision to follow you today. Thank you that we have a God who loves us, a God who cares for us, a God who wants what's good for us. And even though we may leave some things behind and have to do it in faith, God, we can trust that you've got our future in your hand. And, Lord, we just pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.